Hi, uh, my name is Frank James, and I'm the director of Dakota Rail Action, and um, I'm joined today by Patty Lavera, and I'm going to have Patty introduce herself and some of her background in just a minute. This is the first time that we've done anything like this. This is what I think the term of art would be called a podcast. Um, and, uh, but the point of this is that Patty knows more than I do and more than a lot of people do about um, what's going on in Washington around animal agriculture policy. And it's uh, complicated and confusing. And we're going to, we asked uh, Patty to come into this format and help us walk through some of that um, confusion and hopefully at least, at least clear it up a little bit and maybe even give us some ideas about what we can do to get some things done that we'd like to see done. So Patty, would you like to start by introducing yourself? Sure. Um, hey everybody. My name is Patty Lavera and I am sitting here in Washington, DC. Um, and I work on, agriculture and, and food policy uh, for a couple of different groups. One of them is Campaign for Family Farms and the Environment, which DRA participates in. And I've been doing this for a while. For a long time, I was working on um, policy issues, especially factory farm policy issues for Food and Water Watch. And I was there for a long time. And in 2020, I went out on my own to do some consulting. And so right now you're a consultant for uh, Campaign for Family Farms and the Environment. Do we have a, do we call you anything? Are you like an advisor or? I think I gave myself the title of policy advisor once because I needed a title for something. I, so we'll stick I with that. I think that that explains it quite well. <laughs> um, and just because, you know, I want you talking rather than me, why don't you give us the elevator pitch about what the Campaign for Family Farms and the Environment is? Sure. So Campaign for Family Farms and the Environment is four state-based groups from Iowa, Minnesota, Missouri, and South Dakota, and two national groups. And they all do all kinds of interesting work themselves. But when those six groups get together as CFFE, we're looking to do things that really take on the factory farm system. Uh, it is a system. We don't have factory farms by accident. We have them because they get a lot of support from the government. They get a lot of subsidies. And so when we get together as CFFE, we're trying to combine forces and look at ways to kind of, we talk about removing the props that hold up the factory farm system. So we do federal level work a lot of the times, things like the farm bill, what is trade policy that is, you know, greasing the skids for the factory farm system. Like we try to identify those kind of opportunities. Um, and I guess you kind of answered this, but but what about CFFE makes it special? I mean, there's a lot of groups um, in the na nation and um, in Washington working on similar issues that we agree with a lot. So what makes makes CFFE special? I really love working with CFFE because I think we're all very everybody's doing their own thing as their own individual group, but I think we have a, everybody has a similar style in that they all push really hard for what they actually want, right? And that sounds stupid, but it's actually kind of rare uh, in the world of, uh, especially in DC, uh, and in the world of political work and policy work, there's a lot of groups who are like, well, we think we can get this a little bit. And what I love about the CFFE groups is like, no, we're gonna say what we need, and then we're gonna do the work to keep pushing until we get there. So we talk a lot about how do we organize the members of these six groups to get involved and, you know, use our people power to make these changes. We talk a lot about how do we shift the conversation and like shift the narrative to actually get to solutions of what we need, not just like little bits that we think we can get. So um, I always joke, it's really easy to kind of be a lobbyist in DC for a group that knows we're asking for huge things. We might not win. <laughs> I don't have day-to-day -day pressure to like win little bits and pieces just to say we want something. Cause we're going to go hard about the thing we actually want. And why don't you just maybe a little bit, what do we want? What, what, if you had to describe what we're trying to accomplish in our work in a, a national um, political policy areas around animal agriculture, what, what are we hoping to do? 
Yeah, so I mean, the thing that, the ish, I mean, everybody um, in CFFE is working on this, you know, at different levels, at the state level. Um, and the really unifying principle is we don't like factory farms. We don't like this model of raising animals, and we think there's way better ways to do it. So I think our, our vision is that we don't have a system that's dominated by a couple of companies, right, who can have built a supply chain that is bad to animals, bad to workers, bad to farmers, bad to the environment, not great for consumers, right? So we're looking to kind of bust up that corporate control and have a system where people raising animals the right way could make a living. To do that, we have to change things at the USDA. We have to change, um, you know, what our farm bill says. We have to change our trade policy. Like we have so many uh, pieces of at the state level too, but at the federal government level, the meat industry has designed the system they want and they benefit from. So we have a lot of different parts we have to tackle to reverse you know, the system of, of how we're raising animals. So let's get into that a little bit. Um, how would you describe what's going on in Washington right now? And I'll just say, you know, one of the things that just incredibly amazed me was as we moved away from the Trump era into the Biden administration, even during the transition period, the, the, the people who work for, you know, the large animal agriculture economy changed their tune overnight and like figured out exactly what the right message was to appeal to a completely different, um, administration um and did it like on a dime and without like a moment of uh, regret or humility or anything just <laughs> bang oh and they were ready to go um you know obviously i think we got we've got more access now than we did last year um but i am amazed at how the people who had the access last year are also still at the table and also still very much a part of uh, trying to craft what's going to come out of this. But how would you describe this arena that we're in now? Yeah, it's a super interesting time. Um, it, that That's the least interesting way to talk about the last year and a half, right? Um, including, including a transition to a new administration. I mean, the big, big ag generally and the meat industry in particular, I mean, they are nothing if not skilled at wielding their political influence, no matter who's in charge, right? They spread it around. Um, so, and it's really this, and this has been going on for decades, right? They didn't start in, in November after the election cultivating Democrats. They've been doing it for a long time. Um, they, they, they definitely spread the love around so that they're always covered. Um, and they're just very, very good at saying whatever the problem is, even if it's a problem they have caused or a problem they contribute to, that they are the solution, right? So we're finally, how many years later, are finally having a, a policy discussion about climate, you know, agriculture, how does agriculture fit in? And there's a lot of ways that the, you know, the current corporate control of factory farm meat system contributes to climate change, but they, with no shame, Right. And no embarrassment will put themselves out there and say, oh, we're the only solution. You need to double down on us. Right. We're efficient, air quotes. Um, you know, we're the only ones that can do more with less and get more meat per animal and more milk per cow. And, oh, you know, we, we put all those animals in one place and we concentrate their waste and that happens to make methane. Oh, don't worry about that. We'll turn that methane into some kind of alternative fuel and you'll get you'll get carbon credits for it. I mean, I, I give them points for creativity, right? Like you name a problem and they will say they're the only ones that can solve it. And they've had a lot of practice and they have a lot of influence and they get people to carry that line for them, Democrats and Republicans. And how is that manifesting itself? I mean, you kind of alluded to it with the, the, because the other thing that they recently said that they can solve for us is climate change, you know, that they're now the experts on, yeah. on that. And, um, and lo and behold, it's a market-based solution, right? right? What are the things that are happening now around that and what are the implications for like factory farms or people who are facing the 
um, the expansion of factory farms in their communities. Yeah, so it's so, and this is very current. I mean, this is changing day by day at this point. So um, just to catch people up, you know, the the prospects in D.C. is, is anything moving. It's just all about the Senate, right? We have a 50-50 Senate, so you have to find a way to get something through that bottleneck. Um, and so there's, people have probably been seeing in the news, there's been these negotiations between the president and differing parties, different different combinations of Republicans or really moderate Democrats about what they could agree on for an infrastructure package. And that doesn't scream factory farms, but actually it is related to us because it's pretty widely acknowledged the only way you're going to get climate change policy of any size, of any you know significance through the Senate is in some kind of bigger package, and that bigger package is infrastructure. So that's all being negotiated right now. How much money is going to be in an infrastructure package that deals with climate? That's question one. Then question two is of that money for climate, how much of it goes to energy? How much of it goes to transportation? How much of it? But agriculture is in the mix. And what we're getting so far in the debate about climate and agriculture is kind of two paths and they're presented as mutually exclusive. Like if you pick one, you can't do the other, but one that's getting a lot of attention. And this is not an accident because big ag is all for this one path that's on the table. And, and, you know, that big ag is pushing for is we have to fix there's there's not a lot of discussion of you know when agriculture contributes to climate change they don't want to talk about that they want to put agriculture out there as a solution to climate change and the way we make agriculture a solution is through some kind of market based incentive where we do credits right so it's cap and trade where agriculture is generating a credit and a polluting facility that's you know burning coal or you know, burning oil, they could buy the credits for what your farm is supposedly sequestering in the soil. Um, there's a lot of ideological questions about whether that's a good way to do it. Um, were you going to do those things on your farm anyway? Are you taking extra carbon out of the soil because you're getting this credit? Can we actually measure it? So far, we can't really measure it. It's all based on models. Um, and what is the should we keep letting the coal-fired power plant burn coal? Like, is this really the solution, pretending we're going to sequester it all in farm fields? Um, so there's that whole level, but Big Ag is all about this idea, and they are pushing very, very hard because it doesn't make them change anything, right? They're just adding a layer where they can, like, pay um, pay people something for a credit per acre, so it's going to be written for large operations. You know, the big kind of conventional ag folks are really ready to write these programs and say, oh, if you do our brand of no-till, if you do our brand of seed, you know, you're going to generate X, Y, and Z credit. So they're like really ready to like move into that sphere. What we aren't hearing a lot of is how is ag a contributor to climate change? What does it mean when we put 10,000 animals in one building, um, you know, and can find can find them and have a lagoon full of their waste and that waste may break down and release methane into the environment. We were getting little, little conversations about, Oh, we could capture that methane and call it green energy. We're not getting conversations about why don't we not have factory farms? Why don't we not have monoculture agriculture that uses all this synthetic fertilizer? We're not getting like structural change conversations. We're getting, Oh, how do we, you know, how do we create incentives to maybe tweak things a little bit? And Big Ag is super on top of that. Like that's their their big idea for how they're going to fix the climate. And what are folks that agree with us saying? Yeah, so there's a lot of folks who are just saying, trying to point out the holes in that argument, right? Like, is that the way we're going to fix climate? You know, we've tried cap and trade a decade ago and it didn't really work. The market never really came to be. There's a whole side argument about whether we should do this in a private marketplace or the USDA should be involved in making the market. Like they might write the checks to farmers. That's a whole nother level we can fight about. But folks who are thinking, I think in a more like systems way are saying you can't have this conversation about climate change without talking about, we got to get off the fossil fuels right? Like stop contributing. Um, and then can agriculture help? Yeah, probably it can help, but it's not the only way we're going to deal with climate change. We have to get off fossil fuels and stop the, stop contributing to the problem. Um, and then if we want farms to do better practices, then let's help them do better practices with things we already know we have, like conservation programs at USDA, you know, with technical assistance. If you have a problem 
switching to cover crops and you need some technical help, how do we get animals out of CAFOs and onto pasture? Like pasture, well done pasture has tremendous climate smart implications if you're building roofs and you know using all these methods where you have perennial crops on the land. I mean, we need radical systems change about how we farm to really get at that like hardcore level of a much better food system for the climate. That's where you know folks or much folks who are thinking about the food system and thinking about um, you know getting rid of factory farms. That's where we all are. Is how do we use government resources to make those transitions um, and help people make those transitions and help them stay in business if they're raising animals that way that they have somewhere to process them and sell them in their community. Right. We need to make a lot of changes to make a climate friendly agriculture system. Like just ginning up some kind of, you know, credit that a bunch of third parties take a cut of that doesn't really make you change your farming practices probably isn't it. And this really does um, break down to like where the support is going, right? Like, like right now, a lot of support, some of it more visual as far as dollars and cents and than others is going to the the factory agriculture and the, the, the massive agri industry that's producing factory farms. And, um, and, and part of the, part of the result of that is it, it, it then becomes the only, like you said, it then becomes a pair appears to be the only choice we have. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we're saying is if we were to invest in families, the environment, communities, people of color who have been ignored, um, workers, and really invest in, in those systems that supported those people and those ways of doing agriculture, it would be, it would be more successful than what we have now. Is that a fair... Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, so that's, that's, we're kind of talking in a lot of ways, there's there, different camps are kind of talking past each other about, do you just try to get X number of more acres to do one thing, you know, precision ag, right, which, you know, by the way, benefits certain companies, right, to use their resources a little better, or just do this one specific thing with cover crops, which like, fine, it's an improvement. But if we really want to like, get to where we're making a real difference. We're talking about a different system and there's a lot, a lot of things that would have to change to get to that system and government investment, government policy, infrastructure. Do we have what we need to support that system? I mean, those are the kinds of things we want to see on the table in this conversation, not just what is the right amount of tweak to this one program in crop insurance or this one tweak in a, you know, a private carbon market to get you to do this one little practice. Like we're talking about how do we rebuild a system that is better for all of the people in it at every step. It's better for the land, it's better for the animals, and it's going to be better for the climate, right? So if we're doing these big ticket things to take on climate, we should do the big transformation we need to do the food, the food system. Because I think we saw last year that it's pretty broken. Well, yeah. And that's what I was going to ask you next is, I mean, we have seen indications that the system that we have right now, actually, if it is put under any stress at all, it, it, it breaks down. So um, the, it's kind of imperative if we're going to solve climate, if we're going to have safe, um, abundant food, that we do need to change the system. Is that message... Um, being heard by the administration or by people who wouldn't normally be saying that? Yeah, that's what's so interesting. I was just talking about this to somebody yesterday. If nothing else good happened in 2020, we, we took away any excuse where people could pretend that like everything is fine in the food system. Like that was pretty clearly not true last year. And so it remains to be seen what decisions get made and where money is spent and you know what rules are written. But right now, you know, Tom Vilsack, the Secretary of Agriculture, many, many, many members of Congress are saying useful things about we got real problems here. So in terms of assessing 
um, you know, or if I hear the word resilience once, I hear it 15 times a day. If we're assessing the resilience of our food supply chain, it's pretty clear it's low and it's pretty clear that needs to be addressed. So like literally right now, the USDA has a public comment period with, you could write a dissertation with the questions they're asking about, you know, what are the risks in the agriculture supply chain because of imports? What are the risks because we have consolidation? And they use the word corporate consolidation, like that's a first, I think, for USDA. So the message has been received that it's that we have a brittle system. It didn't stand up to stress very well. Congress has given money to USDA to spend as the you know, pandemic response. And so this summer, there's supposed to be a bunch of programs rolled out from USDA that are supposed to make the supply chains more resilient. What we need to see is the details to see if it's, you know, good packaging on the same old, same old where big companies are going to gobble up that money or whether they're actually absorbing what they're hearing, which is that we need more players in these markets, not less. Right. Like just handing money to three companies and saying work on your supply chains is not what we need. Right. So there was there was a hearing yesterday where Secretary Vilsack was the the witness uh, in the Senate. And he said lots of useful things about we need more meat processing. We need smaller meat processors. We need people to be able to sell into local markets. So that part is encouraging, but we haven't seen the steps yet of what they're going to do about it. So this is why it's like a really good opening right now for people to just be on any elected official they can talk to about this is what it looks like, you know, in South Dakota. We need this, this, and this. We need you to do this about cattle markets. We need you to do this about... Um, in processing plants so that they don't get away with kind of doing the same old thing, just with better messaging. So um, I guess the next question I have is how important is South Dakota's congressional delegation? And I guess a, a, a companion mess a question is what have they been doing that's helpful? Yeah. So you have, People, I mean, it's not the biggest delegation, right? But they are in important places in terms of agriculture policy. They're you know, on the Agriculture Committee, on appropriations, which is DC speak for money. So appropriations com- committees give money to agencies like USDA. So like yesterday, um, you know, yesterday uh, when Sec- uh, Secretary Vilsack was talking in the Senate, he was talking to the Appropriations Committee. So you have people in good places to raise these issues. And what I would say that's happening right now that's kind of useful is they're talking in particular about cattle markets. And um, it is moving the needle in terms of something is probably going to happen in terms of policy making. Uh, we need to see what that is. I think you have plenty of folks who are your members who are listening who know that the cattle markets are not working well. There's a lot of dysfunction. And I would say the South Dakota delegation brings it up frequently uh, that there are issues there. And they raise things like we need country of origin labeling, which we need to keep saying. They're talking about we don't have enough buyers. Um, you know, we have this consolidation in these markets and that is lowering, um, you know, it's reducing options and reducing pay to ranchers. And, and several of them talk a lot about meat packing capacity. Why don't we have more options to buy cattle? So I'll take that. I, I, I always want those issues raised. Um, so, you know, you could be cynical and say it's easy to do that when you're the minority party because you don't have to fix the problem. But there are several states where, where the delegations are bringing it up a lot, where cattle are important. And I think we if that's is sustained and we keep bringing it up, um, you know, I think this summer into the fall, hopefully we start to see some actual proposals that are, are getting looked at. What are they doing that's not so helpful? <laughs> um, I think, for lack of a better word, your folks are pretty pretty active participants in kind of like the culture war about what is the role of the government, right? What What is it appropriate for the government to do? We're pretty good at that in agriculture circles. We get pretty tied up in that, right? Like, is it the government's job to talk about land use or... Um, you know, set aside land for conservation, right? I mean, it seems like that's getting pretty hyped up in a in very intriguing way. Um, you know, there's just just the perennials and, and they do it because it works, right? Of just like, oh, you know, the problem is regulation. The problem is the government. In fact, the problem we have in a lot of these issues, you know, like 
like with uh, cattle markets, it's lack of enforcement, right? It's lack of, of rulemaking and actually having anybody regulate that market. They've been running amok for a long time without a lot of enforcement. So the rhetoric about the role of the government is not new, but it's not gotten any better. One thing that I heard one of them say recently that just kind of drove me around the bend was, <laughs> uh, you know, basically pitting farmers against workers and doggone these, these federal um, yes. COVID dollars that, that g- gave workers the ability to, you know, not go to work if it wasn't safe or demand a higher pay or anything like that. And not just, you know, they shifted, shifted the, the, the power balance just slightly away from the, the Packers in this case. And um, they were just bemoaning increases in, in unemployment payments and uh, direct payments from the government and things like that. And it just kind of drove me crazy because, um, you know, m- our members have always seen their closest relationship in this industry with the workers, with the people doing mm-hmm. the work. And, and this guy who said this, he wouldn't last an hour doing any hard labor, either on a farm or in a packing house or anything else. So, you know, you just kind of get a little tired of that sort of rhetoric. Um, and that is, I think, some of the culture wars. It doesn't do any good. It just tends to split people that they don't want talking together. And that, that kind of drives me crazy. Another just, so I was talking to my dad um, a few weeks ago and, you know, he was telling stories and he told when he was in college back in the middle sixties that people would uh, take their summer break and they would go down to, Morell at the time in Sioux Falls, the packing plant, and they would get a summer job working the line and it paid $15 an hour. You know, the, the, the UFCW in, in Sioux Falls recently signed a contract. Do you know their starting wage in that contract stated starting wage is $19 an hour. So from 1965, let's say, uh, somewhere in the mid, he didn't tell me the year, somewhere in the mid 60s to 2021, $4 an hour right. increase. Um, that's not right. Right. And there's no way that these folks ought to be, you know, pitting families raising cattle and hogs against workers who are making only $4 an hour more than temporary workers did in the 1960s. Oh yeah. It's, it's, and it's exactly what you said it is, right? I mean, it's, it's, um, that's a result. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's an unsustainable, inhumane system and it broke last year, right? Because COVID was the stress that that system couldn't take. But the the coverage of it was just like, oh, these workers don't want to work in these conditions. It's like, how dare they? And it was like, you wouldn't want to work in those conditions. No one should work in those conditions, right? And if, if we're going to be mad at somebody that we have a backed up supply chain and that's pushing back on the farms who now can't deliver animals, Let's get mad at the companies who built that system. I mean, the system's not an accident. Those were choices that were made to have plants that big where people work on lines that are that fast. I mean, there's a current example right now that's making me crazy where for years, various sectors of the meat, chick- chicken did it first, pork is in the middle of it. They want basically unlimited line speeds in their packing, in big, large slaughterhouses. Small, small ones wouldn't even try this. Um, they already have quite fast line speeds. They can run 1,100 hogs an hour. But there's a process where they've been trying to get the rules changed at USDA to basically take the caps off the line speed. There have been a, various attempts to stop it, including some lawsuits by workers who were like, hey, this is a work, worker safety nightmare, right, to run these lines this fast. So the workers prevailed, um, got you know, at least got thrown out the thing where they would lift the cap. They're still running very fast. There's still a lot of injuries. It's a dangerous job. So the the trade association for the meat packers, the National Pork Producers Council, 
has launched a, and it's very clear, they launched a PR campaign in the last couple of weeks saying, if you don't let us increase these line speeds, it's going to hurt small family farmers who raise hogs. And it was like, it makes, it makes no sense, right? It's, they're currently running really fast. They're not reducing the current line speed. They're just not letting them blow it up to like a bazillion, you know, a bazillion ahead an hour. Also, and, and so I've re- read some economists kind of taking this on and they're like, here's about four ways you could, you could process more animals if you wanted to. You could work on Saturdays. Workers would love that. They would actually like an extra shift. You could work one hour longer and pay overtime. You could do a lot of things you just don't want to. And you're using these farmers as your PR human shield to say that they're being hurt because you really just aren't prioritizing the, the, the safety or, or economics of your workers. Like, don't use farmers for that. That's you, meatpacker, you know, like, but it's, it works. They do it because it's a distracting way to pit people against each other who have a common enemy, which is the meatpackers. Let's maybe just talk just a minute. And I don't know the hog numbers as well, but in beef packing, the amount of money that the packer has in the past 10, 15 years has taken out of basically the the income of the producer i've heard eight hundred dollars a head is that what you're you hear is it more i mean it's a tremendous amount of money and that doesn't count the amount of money that they're like taking from the workers and other parts of the industry i mean they're making a lot of money for every head of cattle that's going through through their plants and they want to do it even faster um, and they and they're not willing to you know come into the marketplace and pay or play fair with cattle producers in any way shape or form. Can you just maybe talk a little bit about like how this concentration has affected communities and farmers and ranchers and workers um, in an economic way? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I've, I've heard numbers from, from DRA members in that ballpark, right? And then you hear, but I've heard it in other parts of the country too, in Missouri, and you hear about it, you know, I've read an article with folks I actually know in Mississippi saying the same thing. So it's not that it's a regional problem, like, oh, we're just unlucky here, you know, oh, we've got the bad company is dominant here. I mean, it's, the, the details change, but the core problem is true everywhere. Um, and yeah, it's hundreds of, hundreds of dollars a head. I mean, it, I've heard many people over the years say, oh, I guess this year I worked for nothing, right? Because when my day came, this was the day, you know, the stars aligned and everything lined up and this is the day I'm going to sell. Oops, you know, terrible price. I wonder why that is. Um, I, you know, in an attempt to try to understand cattle pricing, I listened to like a three hour webinar last week that USDA ran about their price reporting system. And you know, these are USDA employees. They're they're there to talk about what they do and the mechanics of who puts numbers into the system and when they print a report. I mean, that's what it was. They weren't there and they're not allowed to offer commentary. But there were these little moments where it was like this system is very broken. And you know, just having some reports, and they were they were pitching it and they were trying to put kind of a happy face on it of like this transparency lets people lets producers in the system manage their risk. And it puts all that burden on producers and it's like, or we could have a market that functions well enough, you know, with open bidding and supply where supply and demand sort themselves out because there's actual competitors for those animals, right? That would drive the price up. And instead we're trying to perfect the data system where where several of the speakers they had were brokers who have built computer systems to scrape that data and like know the exact moment to sell futures, you know, like it's not something an average ranchers should have to do to stay in business, right? And there was one point where they were like, oh, and they do it in regions. And there's one region, Colorado, where evidently there's just no price reporting for cattle because there are so few buyers, it trips the privacy guards. And they're like, oh yeah, we don't get reports from Colorado because there's just not enough buyers there. And that, that's been that way for a while. So like, what are you supposed to do as an individual producer that you can't manage your risk in that kind of market, right? That's a broken market. So um, yet I don't, I'm not an economist who can like put a number on the total amount of value taken away, but how do you sustain that? How, do, how much appetite do you have for that year after year after year? If you might be another year where you worked for free because you sold on the wrong day in a marketplace that's not competitive enough to, 
guarantee you like a fair minimum price. I don't, it's astonishing to me that people stick with it, right? It just shows that they like what they do. Yeah. So, you know, we talked to one producer here this winter that uh, gave this example of, you know, $800 a head over a period of years. And if you figured there were three or four other producers in a community of, of this size, you were talking five, six million dollars a year being pulled out of a very small community's economy. And it, it just, you think about that, that a million dollars is a lot of money. And you have in, in like towns of a thousand people, 5,000 people, that's what we're talking about. And you, you're pulling five, four or five million dollars mm-hmm. out of the base economy of that community. No wonder that's a problem. And that money is going to the Packers. Yeah. That's where that, yeah, so it's, that's ending up. It's not disappearing. It's not gone. It's not like the consumer's getting a better deal right. for beef. Right. That money is going directly to the Packers. Right. Um, if, if, if someone has listened to, to us now for a half hour <laughs> and um, they want to do something, what would you say would be helpful for them to do? So I, I always, there's, it's always kind of a two-part answer. And, and we've been kind of trained that our only job in this, because we're talking about food, right, and agriculture, but, you know, most people interact with the agriculture system in the food that they eat, right? So we're kind of trained that, like, our only agency, our only power is, is what we spend and what we buy. And there's, there's absolutely some power there, right? And I know DRA who tries to build local networks where people can support small farmers that were feeding their community. So like when you have options, if you have, you know, the time and the income to go do that, that's great. And I think DRA has lots of resources to try to hook people up to do that. But I always go further than that and say, that's, that's fantastic. And that's a good foundation, but then we got to build on that. And we do have to fix this system. So you don't have to be like, so exceptional to, to be a local food provider. Like it shouldn't be as hard as it is to provide food for your community and, and process it and have that infrastructure. Like we have a lot of policy that needs to change. So I think no matter who you're talking to, if it's local government or up to federal elected officials, I think you can, if you only have 30 seconds and you're not sure the specifics, just be like, I need you to put independent family farmers up front and stop just handing money and handing favorable policies to big ag. If you have a little more time and you're talking to people who are in Congress, we need country of origin labeling back and they can do that. They're going to like hem and haul, like, oh, we can't trade problems. No, they repealed it. They can bring back mandatory country of origin labeling for meat. That would help U.S. producers. And we need them to do things. And this would be a bigger project, but they could start it anytime they wanted. We need them to take on these big meat packers. They are too big. They have too much control in the supply chain. And that makes it too hard for independent farmers and ranchers to stay in business. So they need to start figuring out the antitrust situation and break up these companies. Little bits and pieces, a little bit better data here, a report there is not what we need. We need more dramatic action to break up the big meat companies because they're doing an enormous amount of damage at every level. Well, Patty, thank you so much. (laughs) Um, This has been fun. Um, And you're the first. Um, We'll let you know how this works. And uh, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. It's been fun. Good. Great. I'm going to stop us here. (laughs)